All right, so thank you uh, very much to the organizers. This has been, this conference is a little bit outside of my usual network and I've had just a really fantastic time. So, um, so I really appreciate it. Um, for the people that I do know here, often at computational social science events, I talk about some sort of text as data uh, subject. I'm gonna use a little bit of text as data today in a toy example, but that's not the main main uh, uh, gist of the talk. I will just mention on that because this, take advantage of the audience. Um, Matt Jenskow, Brian Kelly, and myself have a draft survey out of text as data, really geared towards getting more economists involved here. Um, so if anybody, you wanna give that a quick read, we would very much appreciate feedback from the field, from experts like yourselves who are used to working across these interdisciplinary lines. Okay, so with that said, I'm going to talk about economic AI, right? Um, what is that? One of the advantages of, of AI is that nobody really knows what it means. You just get to define it however you want, um, however it's convenient. And so for today, I'm going to talk about AI as breaking complex systemic questions into simple sets of prediction tasks. And the, the subtext there is that these are simple texts of tasks that can be attacked with off-the-shelf arbitrary machine learning, right? So that's the theme. Um, let's back it up a little bit and say, you know, what do, I, what do economists do and why would I try to make any of that artificial? So way, way, way back, um, economists have, and they still do, think about systems, right? So any social scientist here is thinking about system. That's what makes it social science instead of just social looking at stuff, right? Um, and economists are especially proud of this type of thing, and they've built, really codified, a whole language of systems that we work with. Uh, so these are some very basic demand systems that you might see in an introductory textbook. There's a classic table from, uh, um, uh, uh, what's that, the Almost Ideal Demand System paper. Okay, now, this is what economists do. The big question, that I've had from a lot of people, especially in this audience, and I don't know if there's that many economists here, I don't think there are, is why have the economists been so resistant to the sort of machine learning techniques and these ideas, whereas political science has jumped all over them, social science, sociology has jumped all over them, okay? Um, and I think the big resistance has been that uh, perhaps more than the other fields, maybe rightly or wrongly on that statement, but they certainly feel that they attach more value to causal inference, to careful causal inference, right? And causation is this kind of up and down, loosey-goosey philosophical concept, but really what they're saying there is they don't think the sort of just machine learning exploratory approach to things is going to get at enough of the systems that they're studying in order for it to be economically useful. So they've really been chugging along, doing structural work, matching up that structural work with data in the standard econometric causal inference way. So what are economists being asked to do now, right? So these are all pictures from, uh, you know, Microsoft examples, but I've worked with economists at, at, at several firms, large tech firms, and they're being asked to answer standard economic questions at a ridiculous scale, right? So things like, what price should I set? What is my competitor gonna do if I enter in this way? How should this contract be structured? These are basic economic things, but you're asking them over hundreds of thousands of products with input that includes images of products. You're asking this where you have longitudinal clickstream data, all sorts of data on your people. And you're, asking, you're being asked to do it over and over and over again, right? So companies like Microsoft, like Amazon, employ many, many economists because this, there's this massive need for economic labor, okay? And even with that, there's just not enough PhD economists out there to satisfy all of the things that need to be done. And we're seeing this in academia as well, right? If you look at uh, uh, the, the economics job market these days, You'll see people coming out in labor economics or you know, uh, microeconomics, and you'll see a lot of these people, 80% of their thesis is focused on measurement issues, right? Rather than thinking about the economic theory involved or thinking about you know, how they might tell a narrative of why this stuff actually matters. And the reason for that is just the weight of the data, the difficulty of the data processing that they're having to deal with using their old methods is pushing everything else out of the way, okay? So we have an interesting labor issue. 
So when I talk about applied economics or applied econometrics, and I talk about this world of, like I said, I'm seeing job candidates, young researchers who are not able to do economics anymore. They're just basically working on measuring stuff and repeating fairly basic economic observations. Um, there's a few different ways that this works. There's the best way, which is via experimentation, right? So if we want to run experiments, uh, sorry, if we can run experiments, that's obviously the best way to get at some sort of causal point. Um, so the example, you want to know the impact of sponsored search ads on revenue. The problem is, of course, that search ads are targeted towards things that people or there are shown when we think people are going to click on them anyways because those people are already looking for the product. And so what you do is you do an A-B test and maybe you turn on ads or turn off ads randomly and then that tells you, okay, here's the real causal effect of advertisement because the ads were randomized. It was an experiment, so I know this is a valid causal effect. Uh, the problem with experimentation, I guess they're expensive and they're politically difficult to run for big and long experiments. The long one is especially important, right? So uh, even when now I'm in a, a world, an industry where people are very comfortable with experimentation, they're not comfortable with experiments that take a year when you need an answer in a month, right? Um, and also, there's still a lot of labor that goes into analyzing the result of an experiment. But you should experiment if you can. Here's the, the classic, I don't know how many people have read Josh Angris' Mostly Harmless Econometrics book. Um, this style of econometric analysis has been hugely influential. Uh, it's summed up as the, the, the sort of method of instrumental variables, if you know what that is. And the idea is you look for things that are almost experiments or experiments but are not directly related to your treatment of interest out there in the world and do your causal inference on the basis of that randomization. So, What's the impact of going to a charter school on your college success? What's the confounding issue, the reason we can't just measure charter school, college, and see what the correlation is? Well, students who go to charter schools, well, maybe they're there because their parents pushed them or their parents lined up forever. They're different from the students that didn't go to charter schools before they went to charter school, right? That's a selection bias issue. And so what you would do is you would have some sort of a experiment in the allocation of access to charter schools. It's common in the United States to have lotteries and your ranking in that lottery dictates what position you have in line in order to go to the charter school and so you could look at the college success of people that randomly scored high on that lottery versus people that scored low on that lottery. Okay? That's the mostly harmless instrumental variables type of econometrics. The limitations of this I think are pretty serious and not well recognized from the academic side. Um, it requires a high level of sophistication and a lot of luck. Um, and, you know, that's fine. That's, that's more the labor intensive side of things. The other issue um, is that in many cases, especially in academia, these examples are too cute. And what I mean by that is it's not that every school district out there does randomized lotteries in order to figure out who goes to what charter school. It's almost, it's always sorry, it's only the most forward-thinking, typically wealthier school districts that are doing these lotteries. Other school districts just need charter, or they're just taking whatever and putting kids wherever, right? And so what we're getting, and that's just one example, what we're getting when we seek out these funny little instrumental variable setups are really funny, potentially funny, corners of the space of treatment effects, and we're going to then try to generalize that treatment effect that we've learned for this funny little example onto the entire segment of population affected and that transformation or that sorry that transfer might not be valid so i think there's a bit of a crisis of external validity there i'm not going to be able to solve that today but I'll at least be able to make things faster um, and here's probably the most common type of applied econometrics uh, which is, I guess, in contrast to the mostly harmless, this is the hazardous one. Um, and this is where you have a bunch of, you don't have any experiment, but you have a bunch of observable variables that you can control for, right? So this is your standard stats 101. You want to control for something, you just throw it in your regression. What is the sensitivity of consumers to prices? In other words, I want to know the demand curve. Well, the problem is that prices are set in response to consumer demand, right? Hotels are expensive at Christmas and they're sold out. It's not that hotels are sold out because they're expensive, but rather the prices and the sales are moving together in response to holiday demand. 
And the idea is you compare transactions that match on observables in some way, right? So these look like the same demand setting, same day of the year, same type of hotel, same whatever, okay? Except randomly the prices were different, okay? So this is, the, this is a side of matching styles. So anybody who's seen propensity scores, things like that, that's all this sort of slightly hazardous econometrics, okay? Um, here, the issue is very much a labor and a subjectivity thing. So selection of the control variables, the things that you want to match on, there's going to be way too many control variables out there. Potentially, you want to include as many as possible, but of course, you can't include everything if you're just doing dinky little ordinary least squares or something like that. And so you spend months or weeks, if you're really fast, picking out the variables and carefully tuning things until you get your p-values to look nice, right? Um, so that's problematic. Okay, so that's my intro spiel, which took 15 minutes. Um, the, the basic idea of the talk today, and it's going to be high level, is that machine learning can automate and accelerate tasks in each of these applied econometric workflows. Okay? So I'm not going to improve the state of econometrics here other than making it faster automating it and allowing, freeing up economists to think about more interesting questions rather than spending all of their time trying to find the cutest little instruments, okay? Um, so here's an example from that mostly harmless style. So short-term price sensitivity. If I drop my price by 1%, what percent will quantity sold increase? For example, a minus three means that if I increase my price by 1%, my sales drop by 3%. Confounding issue, both prices and sales respond to underlying demand. So you can't just do a machine learning regression for sales onto prices. You'll get crazy things like upward sloping demand curves, right? Which where if you charge more, people buy more. Uh, so what we want is a causal effect and not their co-movement because their co-movement gives us the wrong answer. So here's, here's an example. Um, I don't actually price beer for a living at Microsoft. They don't sell beer. Um, but here's a little example, and you can grab the data off my website if you want to run through it. Uh, so the idea here is I have a bunch of beer transactions from a store in Seattle. And uh, I would like to understand the, the consumer elasticity, the consumer price sensitivity. And for reasons that are fairly straightforward, but I'm not going to go into it, if you regress the log number of units sold onto the log price, the regression coefficient is interpretable as that price sensitivity, okay? So a minus three means that price goes up by one, sales go down by 3%, okay? Price goes up by 1%, sales down by 3%, okay? So two things here, if you just do log units sold onto log price, in other words, all beer brands are exactly the same, you just look at this co-movement thing, for reasons that I mentioned before, because of the confounding, you get a way too tiny uh, elasticity. If you haven't seen these before, you don't know that this is tiny, but anything less than one uh, doesn't make any sense. People would be charging a lot more money, or at least consistently less than one, doesn't make less than minus one, doesn't make any sense between minus one and zero. Uh, if you try and get a separate elasticity for every beer brand, in other words, you do the standard stats thing, and you throw them a dummy variable for the beer brands, then you get elasticities that look like this. Why is that? Because there's, well, there's lots of transactions. This is a month of transactions, so no millions of transactions, but over hundreds of thousands of different beer brands, many of them. So the data is very sparse. You don't have enough information. So this says, for example, that sales go up by 150% if you raise price by 1%, right? That's total garbage, as is the stuff down on that end. Nobody's that price sensitive for beer. So the problem is, okay, just from a pure stats side, we need to group the products together using brand, package, et cetera, things like that. Um, here's the Texas data bit. I could have done that or written a script to do that, but because I'm lazy, what I did is I just tokenized, I just parsed the descriptions of the beer, right? And then I used the words in those descriptions as variables, right? So just counts one if that word is in there, if the word Budweiser in there, two if the word, or one if the word IPA is in there, things like that. So then I'm going to have a regression model. Instead of being a different elasticity, sorry, for every individual beer brand, we're going to have an elasticity that depends upon the presence or absence of the words in the description for that beer. Okay? Very basic text as data type strategy. Okay. Now I have a lot of parameters, though, right? There's a lot of words used to describe beers. Now I, in fact, have more parameters than I have number of observations. How am I going to fit this thing? 
The obvious stats trick would be just to throw it all in a lasso, and that doesn't work, okay? That doesn't work, you mostly get stuff still between minus one and zero, right? And the question, why does that not work? It's because this is not a pure prediction problem, right? The statistical model that's gonna do the best job predicting sales from a combination of beer descriptions and prices is not necessarily the best model for understanding and isolating the causal effect of price on sales, okay? I'll explain why that is in a second, but the basic idea here is that the naive machine learning is conflating two problems, okay? There's two problems here, both of them difficult and high dimensional. One is selecting the control variables that you need to make sure are included in your regression. The second one is predicting the response conditional on those controls. These are both tough statistical learning problems, okay? And they're things that we're right now just squishing together, and that's what doesn't work. There's a really nice and actually fairly old literature on what you need to do to fix this scenario, okay? So what you actually do is you try to ignore, ignore what it says there in terms of, if you know what the conditional score is, you just estimate nuisance functions that are orthogonal to the treatment effect in its conditional score. What this actually means is you're, you have a function where the prices, your treatment, are a function of those covariates, those controls, and then you also have a function where the sales depend on the prices and those controls. And so you treat the dependence of the prices on those covariates, on the words, as a nuisance function, you estimate that thing first, you take the residuals of the prices, and then you use the residuals of the prices in order to uh, uh, predict the response, okay? So just to give credit, I'll work through it in more detail, just to give credit where this is due, this is based on ideas in this Chernozukov et al. paper, uh, but it goes back all the way to Jersey Nyman in the 70s. Okay, so more intuitively, we have a model where we're with prices P and sales Y depend upon these high dimensional covariates. The steps are as follows. You predict prices from the demand variables. You predict sales from the demand variables, okay? That's gonna give you some P hats and some Y hats. And then what you do is you take the regression residuals for the sales and regress those onto the residuals for the prices. To put this in sort of like common sense language, what you're doing is you're finding what's surprising about the sales and what's surprising about the prices and you're taking the surprising bits onto the surprising bits. So even though you didn't have an experiment, you're creating an experiment here. Okay? And so now these two steps, those first two steps up there, now those are arbitrary prediction tasks. So what we've done is we've taken a problem that was a tough causal inference problem, and we've broken it up into two simple prediction tasks. You can fit a random forest to this. We use deep neural networks. You can use whatever you want right, in order to do these things. And that frees you up to put whatever you want into X as well. You can have images, you can have text, you have whatever you want, okay? So that's the kind of the, the, the basic idea. Um, one thing I'll mention, because Justin mentioned it yesterday, I just added this on here. Um, data splitting, which he mentioned was a really good idea, is just in general a fantastic idea that in industry we use a ton, but I don't think in academia it's used enough. And what I would do here is I would maybe estimate my two nuisance functions, how price depends on those variables and how sales depends upon those variables on one data set, and then take another data set to estimate the final regression of residuals on residuals, okay? And academics might, you, you know, you might freak out and say, hey, what about my power? I don't have enough sample size. Turns out, really simple, if you do it twice, so you do that once and you get your estimates, then you make the auxiliary sample the other one, you switch these, now you estimate the residuals on this, and you do the final regression on there, then you average your results, and your efficiency is then on the same order, okay? So use data splitting more often. And I can elaborate on that if anybody wants to chat about it. And then when you run this thing with the beer again, you can go check out the code. If you're curious about that, now you finally get reasonable uh, uh, elasticities, things that live mostly between minus one and minus six. Uh, which is the range we expect, and then we actually do experimental validation afterwards. Not for the beer, but for stuff that we, we actually sell, okay? So, so that's, that's, and the text encodes a natural hierarchy, things like that, okay? Um, 
that's what econometricians do. This might seem fairly straightforward, right? But my point that I'm trying to make today is not that complicated. It's about getting ML into economics. Economists and econometricians are very good at breaking down the problem into a bunch of things that look like just pure prediction problems. Now, previously, they weren't hitting those with machine learning. They were hitting them with something like ordinary least squares, which led to the massive labor uh, uh, shortage, right? But if you're an economist or econometrician or you expose that literature, go back to it and say wherever they're talking about measurable equations and they're slotting in ordinary least squares, you can now just slot in arbitrary machine learning. Right? It's the same idea. You're breaking down a causal question, a structural question, into a series of very simple prediction tasks. And so very briefly, I'll touch on the, the another one that we're looking at. Um, instrumental variables. If you don't know what it is, you probably are not going to know from this. But the basic idea is that you have some weird world where you want to understand your treatment effect on Y, but there's, you know, there's outside omitted variables confounders getting in the way of your, your, your relationship here. But what you have out there is some source of randomization in your treatment variable. And because of that source of randomization, you can do causal inference. There's all sorts of stories about uh, uh, instrumental variables. To me, the place where they work uh, is when it's um, what I call upstream randomization. You can think about this as an intent to treat type setup. So if you're in a medical trial and they have, uh, you know, say you, you have some uh, um, drug that you want to get people to take as a treatment, you randomize access to that drug. You can't force people to take the drug, right? So if the drug is painful to take in some way, particularly if it's painful to take, if your disease status is better or worse or something like that, okay, then you're going to have a trouble where you randomized access but the actual treatment, the taking of the drug was not randomized, right? The randomization of access there is an instrumental variable, okay? And you can use these techniques in order to recover what the actual effect of treatment was rather than the effect of randomization of access to treatment, okay? So that's why I call upstream randomization. If you've seen ordinary, or sorry, instrumental variables, you've seen two stage least squares where you first regress the uh, uh, price variable onto the instrument, and then you take the fitted treatment, uh, uh, um, uh, the expected value of the price, which is going to be my Z tau hat, and you regress Y onto that instead of onto the original price. Again, if you hadn't seen IV before, I probably didn't teach it to you there. Um, okay, so here's, here's just the other idea, though. The instrumental variables problem or setup implies this top line here, which is that the expected value of your response, given your covariates and your instruments, is equal to the structural problem of interest, sorry, g given p and x is our, our, our true causal function, integrated over the conditional distribution for that treatment variable, given those covariates, okay? Um, this implies a loss function, right? So this implies very generally a loss function where I need to minimize, choose this function to minimize this whole thing here, where this guy here is any estimate of the conditional distribution for the treatment variable in those instrument and the covariance, okay? Again, the point I'm making is nothing radically new. This is normally where the economists would diverge and look at various least squares methods for approximating this thing. And the mentality I'm trying to drill into people is, no, we can fit these things directly because we have ability to do that. I can go out there and I can fit a, denster, uh, a density mixture network or some sort of deep net in order to get that conditional distribution. I can then go out there conditional on that, you know, just take derivatives with respect to this and minimize that loss function again using some sort of deep neural network representation for that function there. Okay? And so that's what we do. We just take these things that are implied by old school econometrics, and instead of using ordinary least squares, we hit them with deep nets. What is a deep neural network? I think I only have like a minute left, so I'll just say very quickly, lots of connections, lots of nodes. Um, everybody's heard of them. There's a ton of hype about them. Um, really what they are is just fast and cheap. There's no magic to them. Um, I won't talk about it. Well, for the econometricians in the room, if there's any, deep nets are not non-parametric. There's a real misconception that they are. They're semi-parametric because they involve a massive dimension reduction at the first layer. 
Uh, we could use these things to, to for, for, I don't want to go into the example in detail, but basically we can use these things for all sorts of causal inference setups, the most compelling of which are when we have images of products, right? So or images of, of uh, um, whatever, uh, so let's talk about a price setting. We might have a, a, the price sensitivity depends upon the image of the beer label, right? So what we can do is we can use that image as input to the deep neural net if there's been any sort of upstream randomization. And I'm not going to talk about the example because I don't have any time. So, um, so what I'm just going to say just to finish off, and I'm happy to follow up on any of this, the, the idea of this talk today is certainly not radical, right? All I'm trying to say is that the machine learning doesn't create any new insights. It doesn't create any sort of uh, replacement or automatic economist. But what it does is you can take the sort of structural econ, nice reduced form econometrics that you're already doing, same thing applies in social science, find the things that are just pure prediction tasks, and instead of working hard to optimize those, outsource those to some sort of machine learning, okay? Um, the other thing I'll say is that instrumental variables are everywhere inside firms because we're always randomizing, but not the right things. For social scientists, I added this one, this one slide here. Um, again, there's a ton of hype about deep learning. I don't know if it's kind of sort of met this community yet or if people are using these tools yet. Um, deep learning is very good low human cogs or low development cost off the shelf machine learning. It is again not magic, right? It's very expensive in terms of computation time. It's very expensive in terms of like energy. We're heating up the globe with all the deep nets that we're fitting. But it is very cheap in terms of researcher time. This stuff is just very fast to prototype. And that is its value. Okay, anything else where you see where people are like, deep nets are magic, they're gonna figure this out, that's total garbage, right? Deep nets are fast and cheap and they work on lots of various different things. So the reason that that's really cool is that the next big thing is gonna be not how do we improve the machine learning, which is really the industry right now at NIPS and ICML and things like that. It's shifting to how do we combine these machine learning tasks together to do better AI, and that's gonna be all about combining the deep nets with the domain expertise, which is what I was trying to do here. Thanks.